So let's talk about the Apocrypha. What is it? What is it not? Should you read it? But before we get started, if you haven't already subscribed, we would really appreciate that. Just click the little subscribe button. So easy, doesn't cost you anything, and it really helps us out. Other things that help us out are interacting with this channel. So clicking the notifications icon or leaving comments whenever you see a video that you find interesting. All those things just tell YouTube, hey, we like this channel and we want to see more of it. So we really appreciate your help. And another way you can help the channel is check out our Disciple Dojo store. We have all kinds of stuff there from the sweatshirt I'm wearing right here to other Bible nerd designs, gifts, coffee mugs, even training gear. Take a look. Anything you buy really helps us out. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about the Apocrypha. So what actually is the Apocrypha? I mean, if you have some study Bibles, like let's say the CEB study Bible that we've reviewed here on the channel, if you missed that review, go check it out. I'll put a link in the description. But whether this or the Oxford Annotated or a number of other study Bibles, sometimes you'll see it says with the Apocrypha, or it'll say with Deuterocanonical books, if it's a Catholic study Bible. Well, when you open one of these study Bibles, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll see this section of books, and they have funny names. Names like Tobit, or Maccabees, there's four of those, Esdras, Bell and the Dragon, sometimes Bell and the Snake. So what's going on? What are these books? Are these forbidden books? Are these books that the church got together and decided are too mysterious or too powerful, or they reveal embarrassing things about Jesus, and so they did away with them? No, none of that. The apocryphal books aren't secret. They weren't unknown to Christians. In fact, Martin Luther's first translation of the Bible in German included the apocryphal books. Only later in the Reformation did Protestant Bibles stop including them. Some of them still get read even in the Church of England. The apocryphal books have always been part of the Christian faith. So what are they? Well, any answer to that question will obviously be truncated, and there will be layers of nuance that need to be given. In fact, I'm going to be having an expert in the apocryphal books on next week here in the dojo, and we're going to talk all about that as well as a number of other things. But as a way of just wrapping your mind around what the apocryphal books are, think about them this way. They were books that were written by Jews before the time of Jesus, but after what we know of as the Old Testament canonical books. So in between what in our Protestant Bibles ends at Malachi, in between that and the beginning of Matthew, there's about 400 years. And during that time, things were still happening. A lot of things were happening. The Jews were all over the empire from Babylon all the way to Egypt and even on further, eventually making it all the way to the Western Mediterranean. And those Jews had their books their Hebrew Bibles, Tanakh. Now, they didn't have them all bound together, but they had the books that we would know of as the Hebrew Bible. But that didn't mean they stopped writing. That didn't mean they stopped telling stories. That didn't mean that they stopped collecting proverbial wisdom. They were continuing to produce works. Most of these works, however, were produced in Greek. Even the ones that were written in another language, say Hebrew or Aramaic, they eventually got translated into Greek and collected with the other books from that period that were written in Greek. Again, this is all oversimplified, so any apocryphal Second Temple scholars out there, just bear with me. I'm trying to explain this to people who don't know what the apocrypha are. Well, those books became part of the broad corpus of literature known as the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so the Septuagint works ended up including not just what we know of as the Old Testament books that Protestants and Jews both agree on, but also those writings, those very Jewish writings known as the apocryphal books. They were included in the Septuagint. And that's the collection of scripture that many, if not most, early Christians used as scripture. Most early Christians couldn't read Hebrew. They relied on the Septuagint as their Old Testament. That's why many times in the New Testament, when the New Testament cites an Old Testament passage, it's often citing the Septuagint version of that Old Testament passage, because that's what the Greek-speaking world read as their Old Testament. Now, the apocryphal books were never seen as authoritative or scripture 
in the same way that the other Old Testament books were seen, even by Jews. And within Judaism, they were not preserved. It was Christians who preserved these Jewish writings that predate the New Testament as something akin to Scripture. The early church fathers, the medieval theologians, the, the reformers, they would read the apocryphal books. They would note the apocryphal books. They never put them on the level of scripture. That's why you'll see them called sometimes deuterocanonical. That means secondary canonical. They're not quite scripture, but they're edifying reading. They're good reading. And so for those of us who are Protestant, we look at the apocrypha and that's how we see them. They're good books. They're interesting books. They're fascinating insights into the world of Second Temple Judaism. But for other Christian traditions, they put them closer to the level of scripture than we would. And it differs from tradition to tradition. The Apocrypha in a Catholic Bible is going to be slightly different than the Apocrypha in a Greek Orthodox Bible. And that's going to be slightly different than the Apocrypha in a Coptic Bible. There are different traditions in how the Apocryphal books are handled. And so I wanted to share a couple of resources that other Protestant Christians people from broadly my tradition or those who just aren't familiar with the Apocrypha can go to to get a better understanding of what it is you're reading. Now, I've already mentioned the CEB Study Bible, and I think the strength of this Study Bible is that it does contain the Apocrypha. Now, there are versions of the CEB Study Bible that don't have the Apocrypha. In fact, I think somewhat disappointingly that the CEB Study Bible with the Apocrypha is no longer in print. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I heard that they were no longer printing the version with the Apocrypha, which is a shame because that's the best version of this study Bible. But the Apocrypha does exist in the CEB translation, the Common English Bible. And the CEB is a very readable translation. It's written in idiomatic English. It's something akin to the New Living Translation. So if you're looking for a uh, translation of the apocryphal books that's easily readable, I would recommend getting it in the CEB translation. You may be able to buy it as a standalone, I'm not entirely sure, but you can read the CEB translation of the apocryphal books on Bible Gateway or most other Bible apps that include the CEB translation. So that would be my recommendation if you're looking for an easy to understand free translation of the apocryphal books just to kind of get the gist of them. Now, if you're looking for a more technical and more uh, word for word translation, something that you can almost see the underlying Greek a little bit better. In other words, you're looking for something for academic study of the apocryphal books. Lexham has the Lexham Old Testament Apocrypha. This is based on the Lexham English Septuagint, and it is. it started out as their interlinear translation that Lagos Bible app uses. And so it's going to read more literal, kind of in some places a little more wooden, a little more, you will know you're reading a translation of the Septuagint, which itself is a translation of the Hebrew. So this feels like you're reading a translation where the CEB maybe reads a little more like modern common English, thus the name common English Bible. But the Lexham Apocrypha translation is interesting in a couple of ways. One, the introduction and all of the book introductions are written by David De Silva. Now, I mentioned I'm going to be having an Apocrypha expert on to discuss all of this next week. Well, that's David De Silva. He's going to step into the dojo and we're going to have a chat about all things apocryphal. And I'm really looking forward to it. So don't miss that episode. But the Lexham Apocrypha has book introductions. Well, it has a general introduction in the beginning by David De Silva, and then all of the book introductions to each apocryphal book are also written by David De Silva. And one thing that I like about it, it's single columned. A lot of room for writing in the margins, taking notes. You can see the layout when it's a poetry section. And there are little subject headings, but they're not in the text. They're out here to the side, which is a nice feature. So if you're serious about learning, studying, reading the Apocrypha, or you just want it in a more um, academic translation, check it out. And a good companion to go along with it is David De Silva's Introducing the Apocrypha, Message, Content, and Significance. This doesn't have the text of the Apocryphal books in it, but it's like a handbook of the apocryphal book. So it'll have an introduction to the book and then it'll walk through, okay, here's what the background of this book is. Here are the major themes in this book. Here are the importance of what you're reading in this book for 
later Christian doctrine. Here's how this influences the New Testament. All the stuff that kind of like why the Apocrypha matters, you're going to find in here. This is the first edition. There's a newer edition that's been published since then. I just don't have that one. But introducing the Apocrypha. If you get that and Lexham English Apocrypha, then these make a good combo to use for not just having the books, but also being able to understand them. One other interesting feature about the Lexham English Apocrypha is it includes a book that's not technically part of the Apocrypha. It includes a book that's part of the Pseudepigrapha. So the Pseudepigraphical books were kind of like popular books, but they were never even included as apocryphal books, much less as scripture. And the Lexham English Apocrypha puts one of those at the back, and that is the book of First Enoch. At the very end, you have First Enoch, which is a pseudepigraphical book, not technically part of the Apocrypha. So you won't find Enoch in any study Bibles that have the Apocrypha, but you will find it in collections of New Testament pseudepigraphical writings. And First Enoch actually gets alluded to by Jude in the New Testament, and it was a formative book, at least in the thought world of the Second Temple period. And so the Lexham English Apocrypha includes it in that volume. Now, the apocryphal books are Jewish books, and the irony is that it was Christians who preserved these Jewish books, and only in later centuries did Jewish scholars start to reappreciate the value of the apocryphal books. And so, as Jewish scholarship more or less rediscovered this part of Jewish history, that was preserved mostly by Christians and Christian scripture collections, a number of Jewish scholars have given more attention to it. And so there is a resource that I definitely recommend. It's called the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha. These are Jewish scholars who see the value in studying the Apocrypha and what it brings to reconstructing the world of the Second Temple period. And the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha is great because nearly a third of the book at the end are essays that have to do with the Apocrypha. So if you saw the review I did of the Jewish study Bible by Oxford, well, this is also by Oxford. It's very similar in format. You have the text, you have annotations throughout the text that help explain it. And then at the end, you have a massive collection of essays. So you have essays on the Babylonian and Persian period, history and culture, the Hellenistic period, history and culture, the Roman period, ancient Jewish sectarianism, the archaeology of Second Temple Judaism, the Hasmonean state and ancient Jewish nationalism, the canon, the Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Peshitta and the Syriac biblical context, the Apocrypha in rabbinic literature, the Apocrypha in medieval Jewish literature, wisdom in the Apocrypha, literary approaches to the Apocrypha, the incredible expanding Bible, Torah, Law and Commandments, prayer in the Apocrypha, Hanukkah in the Apocrypha, Jewish heroes in the Apocrypha, gender, Jewish theology in the Apocrypha, evil and sin, Jewish identity in the Apocrypha. And then there's a timeline and there's glossaries of all of these terms. So this is a great resource for understanding how Jewish scholarship interacts with the Apocrypha and for just getting the Jewish background of these apocryphal books that were Jewish books. One reason that I recommend the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha is because just like the Lexham Apocrypha included First Enoch at the back, at the beginning, the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha includes the Book of Jubilees. Jubilees is another book that's not considered technically part of the Apocrypha, but it is a retelling of the history of Genesis and Exodus, supposedly by the angel of the Lord to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it fills in and expands a lot of traditions that arose around the events of Genesis and the early events of Exodus. And it was originally written in Hebrew, but it's been preserved in Ethiopic, in the Coptic Bible, and it is still a part of the Coptic Apocrypha. So it was cool reading Jubilees and getting Jewish scholarship study notes as I read through the book. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it a lot. This was part of my Judaism January reading. And it's what made me want to do this video about the apocryphal books because they are part of Jewish history and Christian history, even though they're not in the Bibles that both Protestant and Jewish traditions today use. Now, the Jewish annotated apocrypha is in the New Revised Standard Version. So if you just want to read the apocrypha, 
without the notes, without all the supplemental material, this is just the new revised standard version, except for Jubilees, because that's not included in the NRSV. And if I were gonna line these up on a spectrum, I would probably arrange it this way. From the easiest, the most thought for thought, paraphrastic translation, normal, everyday, common, idiomatic English, to the more technical, more formal, a little more wooden translation, the Lexham Apocrypha. And the New Revised Standard would probably be somewhere in the middle between the two. And so we'll do a quick comparison so you can see the shortest of the apocryphal books, Psalm 151. And it's a psalm that claims to be written by David about his victory over Goliath. And it's only seven verses. And here's how it reads in the Lexham English Apocrypha. I was small among my brothers and the youngest one in the house of my father. I was shepherding the sheep of my father. My hands made an organ, my fingers prepared a harp. And who will report to my Lord? The Lord himself, it is he who will hearken. He dispatched his messenger and raised me from the sheep of my father. He anointed me with the oil of his anointing. My brothers were handsome and big, but the Lord was not well pleased with them. I went out to a meeting against the foreigner, and he imprecated curses upon me with his idols. But I, after drawing the sword from him, beheaded him and took away the reproach from the children of Israel. Now let's read it in the Jewish annotated Apocrypha. This is the New Revised Standard Version, same poem. I was small among my brothers and the youngest in my father's house. I tended my father's sheep. My hands made a harp, my fingers fashioned a lyre. And who will tell my Lord? The Lord himself, it is he who hears. It was he who sent his messenger and took me from my father's sheep and anointed me with his anointing oil. My brothers were handsome and tall, but the Lord was not pleased with them. I went out to meet the Philistine, and he cursed me by his idols. But I drew his own sword. I beheaded him and took away disgrace from the people of Israel. So you can already see a little bit of the difference in the Lexham. It says, he imprecated curses upon me with his idols. In verse 6, New Revised, he cursed me by his idols. So a little more simplified, but not quite matching the exactness of the Greek text. Now, the CEB translation notes that Psalm 151 is a composite, that it was originally composed most likely of a couple of different Hebrew texts put together into ultimately what became the Greek text. And so they give you first the two Hebrew texts that were likely combined, and then they have the Greek text on the next page. But this is how it reads in Psalm 151, the Greek text. I was small among my brothers and the youngest of my father's sons. I was shepherd of my father's sheep. My hands made a musical instrument. My fingers strung a lap harp. Who will tell my Lord? The Lord himself. The Lord hears me. The Lord himself sent his messenger and took me away from my father's sheep. He put special oil on my forehead to anoint me. My brothers were good looking and tall, but the Lord didn't take special pleasure in them. I went out to meet the Philistine who cursed me by his idols, but I took his own sword out of its sheath and cut off his head. So I removed the shame from the Israelites. So you can see it uses contractions. It explains special anointing oil or musical instrument a little more interpretive than just a rigid translation of the Greek word. But at the end of the day, I think every Christian should be aware of the Apocrypha. I think we should not be afraid to read it. It's not some secret, hidden, demonic books. It's not something the church has tried to hide in dark backroom councils. It's nothing like that. If you're going to know the New Testament, you need to know the Apocrypha because the Apocrypha bridges the gap between the world of the Old Testament and the world of the New Testament. And a lot of stuff happened in between those centuries. Things in the New Testament that were taken for granted are explained in the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha has stories about Jews who were willing to die rather than eat unclean food. A mother had to watch her seven sons put to death in front of her because they wouldn't eat pork. I mean, there were times in Israel's history where there was intense pressure to abandon the ways of their ancestors, and they would rather die than do that. So this helps explain when you come to the New Testament why unclean food and eating it is such a big deal, why it matters, why there was a scandal when Jesus started doing things that implied that that era of separation between Jew and Gentile was coming to an end. The events of Hanukkah, the Festival of Light celebrating the dedication of the temple. That's talked about in Maccabees, and it's just taken for granted by the time of the New Testament. So knowing the Apocrypha 
It's not going to really give much insight in the Old Testament, but it's going to shed a lot of insight into the world of the New Testament. So if you're looking to better understand the Apocrypha, these are some of the resources I would recommend. If you have questions about the Apocrypha, leave them in the comment section below. Like I said, David De Silva is coming on. I would love to have some great questions from viewers to be able to ask and to get his insights on. So take advantage of that in the comments section. But if you are watching this video after February 10th, don't leave a question in the comment section because we will have already had the interview by then. I'm a little time sensitive. So I hope this gives a little glimpse of what the Apocrypha is, why it matters. I don't intend for this video to be comprehensive or exhaustive. This is just an appetizer. And so I just wanted to give you some resources that would help as you dig deeper into these fascinating ancient Jewish writings. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is part of your history as well. That's all for now. As always, if you appreciate this ministry and you want to help us out, we would love for you to consider becoming a monthly dojo donor at any dollar amount you can spare. All of our resources are entirely free, and that's only possible because of those of you who give on a monthly basis. You keep this ministry going, and you're greatly appreciated. That's all for now. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. Mm -hmm.